I've been watching the Sacramento Kings for 21 years, and this is my eighth season covering the team professionally. And in all that time following this group, most of the time this team losing during that stretch, never once has a team made me want to watch them less than this current Sacramento Kings team. It's hard to care. It's hard to buy in. It's hard to follow. And there are times that, quite honestly, I dread spending my evenings watching this team. The Kings and the Denver Nuggets tonight on a Friday night was no different. Kings lose again. They lose by just 10 points. Felt like 30. We'll talk about it. Plus, we'll talk about De'Aaron Fox on a good stretch. Should we disregard his slow start to the season or still be concerned about that? And Kings fans are really getting impatient with general manager Monty McNair. But should the Sacramento Kings be thankful that it's that and not something else? We'll talk about it all on today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. If you're looking for in-depth analysis, game-by-game breakdowns, highlights, interviews with local and national experts, Full coverage of your Sacramento Kings from January through December. This is the place for you, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. My name is Matt George. I normally say I have the privilege of hosting the Locked On Kings podcast, but it doesn't really feel like a privilege as of right now. It is a privilege uh, to be able to speak to all of you, though, regardless of how the Kings are doing. Uh, I've been a Sacramento Sports Media member for the last seven years. Like I said, this is my eighth season covering Kings basketball, formerly for Sacramento Sports Talk Radio at KHDK, now with ABC 10 News and Television. And man... Like If I did not get paid, if it was not my job to cover this team, even as big of a basketball fan as I am, growing up a diehard fan of this team, born and raised in the Sacramento area, been following this team since I was six years old. If it weren't for this job and this podcast and my responsibilities, I would not watch this team. There are so many better ways for me to spend a Friday night. And I have never felt like this before. Even when the Kings were horrific, like we're talking the year that they won like 17 games or something like that. I don't know if it was that few felt like 17 games. I don't know. Uh, It was the year that they got, they had the best odds of the number one overall pick ended up getting the number four overall pick. And they, they took Tyreek Evans. Even when the team was that bad, I enjoyed following that team and watching that team more than I enjoy following and watching this team. And I admit a lot of that does have to do with my expectations that were just too high for this group expectations that I talked about a lot here on the locked on Kings podcast, tried to convince myself and convince you that this team was going to be good enough this year, that the changes that they made, the acquisitions that they made during the off season, being able to re-sign Rashawn Holmes, running this group back. This was going to be the year that they were figuring it out. De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton going into their second season, playing together with Tyrese more than likely going to be the starter on a nightly basis. Like, I tried to come up with all the reasons why I thought this team was going to be good enough. And really, truthfully, on paper, you look at this roster, you see the talent on this roster, this talent, this team should be good enough to make the play-in in how weak of a Western Conference we're experiencing right now. But here they are. They're in the 11th spot. They're struggling to make the play-in, even with the doors wide open with how bad the West is. And even if this team does somehow find their way in the play and just because the West is so bad, like we've talked before on this podcast, does this team look like they belong? Does this team look like they have any hope of winning two games, two single elimination games to actually make it to the playoffs themselves? Which again, the playoffs were the bar. The playoffs were the goal, not the play in. Making the playoffs through the play-in, that was the goal. Not just making the play-in, being eliminated and saying, hey, well, at least we played in technically postseason basketball. This Kings team is so hard to watch. So hard to watch. Even when they have the prospect of being able to play well. Even when you know that every once in a while they can rattle off 140 plus performances like they did against Charlotte earlier on in the year. Even when they can rattle off triple overtime wins against the uh, the, the Los Angeles Lakers led by LeBron James. Even a, a win uh, earlier this week 
the Kings beating the Miami Heat to open up the, the 2022 year. Even when there are the possibility of games going that well, the possibility of this team playing to that level, which we know they are capable of, it just doesn't feel worth it. It feels like it's going to be a coin flip every single night as to which version of the King shows up, except somehow the coin is weighted so that it always lands on tails, which is the bad team side. Like it's a 50-50 shot, but in reality, it's like 60-40, but in reality, it's like 70-30, but honestly, it's 80-20. <laughs> like that's how it feels with this Kings group. They have so much potential to be so much better. They're capable of being better. We've seen it. And yet, this is what they are. Extremely difficult to watch. Extremely difficult to get excited about. That is why I do not blame any Kings fan for turning off their television or not paying attention or hell, even tuning out of the Locked on Kings podcast. Although I, I sincerely hope that you don't. I hope that you stick in and stick around here on Locked on Kings throughout this season because this can be your, your place of um, healing, I guess, or we can come together in a little kumbaya circle and, and, and suffer through seasons and games like this together. But I don't blame Kings fans at all for not buying tickets. I don't blame Kings fans for the Golden One Center being as empty as it's been so far this season. And it's going to get worse. I'm telling you, it is going to get worse. We're going to talk about how fans have been impatient and are getting really impatient when it comes to Monty McNair. And I'm not saying impatience is a bad thing at all. It's very justified. But the Sacramento Kings should be lucky that Kings fans still care. We're going to get to that at the end of the podcast. Like I said in the intro too, want to talk about De'Aaron Fox because despite everything, he had a good game. I think it's his third straight 30 plus point performance. He's been playing a lot better. And we remember how negative we were and, and concerned we were with how slow uh, he got off to his start uh, earlier on this season. We're going to discuss whether or not we should disregard that season or not, or that start to the season and, and pay more attention to what Fox is doing right now and arguments for and against that. We'll get into that. But in terms of this game tonight, Kings losing by 10 points. I mean, where do we even start? What do we even talk about? There's no positives other than Fox scoring 30 that I can pull out of this game. I guess I could talk about Alex Len making an impact, but at the same time too, who cares? Like who cares? Len, He's a solid player. He's a player that I like. He's a player that hasn't played too much because he was in health and safety protocols and uh, came back and has just been kind of working his way back into a role. He's been fine. He did halfway decent against Nikola Jokic. But defensively as a whole, this Kings team was pathetic, pathetically bad. Like we know this team is bad defensively, but tonight was pathetic. You know, I, I've heard players say, I don't think it's a question of effort with this team. It's a question of execution. I've heard Tyrese Halliburton say that. Excuse me. I've heard De'Aaron Fox say that. This is why fans question effort. Because the the the, pist or, uh, the Nuggets basically could have walked to the rim tonight. They were getting anything and everything they wanted in the paint. You've heard the term brought up a lot by former head coach Luke Walton. Heard it brought up a lot uh, on this podcast. Heard it brought up uh, a lot during King's broadcast. If you listen to Kyle and Katie or, or um, Mark and Katie, straight line drives where a, a player uh, the, uh, and a King's opponent attacks the basket and just gets a straight path to the rim for a layup or a dunk. Those should not happen at the NBA level. And yet they happen not just nightly, not just quarterly, almost every possession, at least they did tonight for the Kings against the Denver Nuggets. Defensively, the Kings are horrible. They don't communicate. They give up easy baseline uh, cuts to the rim, easy uh, cuts to the rim from the top of the key. You know, basic BS fundamental basketball stuff that you and I learned when we were in preschool. Like that's what that's what's so infuriating to me about the Kings and their defensive effort because these are fundamental basketball things that you learn as a freaking child. This is not complex basketball um, philosophy that you learn and adapt and 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 start to really soak in and, and, and buy into when you get into the NBA and you see things on a different level. No, this is basic fundamental basketball. And I don't care that you're guarding 
the greatest players on the planet. I don't care that you're guarding the former MVP and Nikola Jokic. Just because Nikola Jokic is a phenomenal passer doesn't mean you have to give him the easiest assist on the planet by letting Jamichael Green or Jeff Green or whoever the hell you want cut easily baseline without even putting a body on him. I don't care if you're facing the former MVP, I should say the current MVP. Doesn't matter to me. You can't make those basic boneheaded defensive mistakes, but that is what this Kings team does and what they are. It, it's mind blowing to me. Now, this is also coming from someone, and I readily admit this, this is coming from someone who knows how to play that defense, but I don't know if I could step onto the floor and execute against NBA players. In fact, I, I know for the m- most part, I couldn't. So any NBA player that might hear this podcast, and I don't know if Kings players listen or not, I'm guessing not, but if they they would roll their eyes and come back at me, if, if one was sitting right next to me, they would look at me and, and give me the typical, well, then you go out and try it. Respond. If you think it's so easy, you go out and try it. Respond. I get that. I might not be able to execute it, but I at least know what the hell it is and how to do it. This Kings team doesn't look like, one, they know what it is or how to do it, and two, they don't give a damn to try it. I would at least try. I'd fail. I guarantee I'd fail, but I'd at least try. This King team, Kings team doesn't look like they're trying. It's a bunch of individuals out there playing one-on-one defense, getting beat, and then just watching. Now, they did have a couple of halfway decent defensive possessions, not stretches, possessions. But, of course, that's not nearly going to be enough. We knew defense was not a strength of this Kings team. The two major strengths of this Kings team, pace and offense, are also horrifically bad. Pace. We know this Kings team has a tremendous amount of speed, especially when De'Aaron Fox is on the floor. So can somebody please explain to me how in the world Nikola Jokic, who is almost 290 pounds, granted he's the he's the MVP, phenomenal player, I'm not taking anything away from Nikola Jokic. How are you getting beat down the floor by a 290-pound uh, center in, in, fa- in the fast break? How is that possible? That's not... Jokic all of a sudden getting a burst of speed. That's not getting beat by a better team. That's just being lazy. You can't get beat down the floor by Nikola Jokic in transition when that is supposed to be your strength. And I'm talking about everybody. It's not just Alex Len, who isn't too fast himself. Marvin Bagley got beat down the floor. De'Aaron Funk got beat down the floor. Tyrese Tyrese Halliburton got beat down the floor. Everybody got beat down the floor. And you can see the video on Twitter, or on YouTube, anywhere. Just look up Nikola Jokic tonight. He didn't just do it once or twice. Hell, he got a rebound, took the ball up the floor by himself, nobody stopped the ball, and he threw a highlight no-look pass for an easy layup or dunk. I can't remember. Either way, it was an easy bucket in the paint. How are you getting beat in transition by Nikola freaking Jokic, and you expect anybody to believe that this team doesn't have an effort problem? as well as a just bad basketball team and bad fundamental basketball IQ problem. And then offense. Remember how much I told you? Remember how much we were told by coaches that are no longer here, coaches who are here, players who are here? Hey, offense isn't a problem. We know we can score. We know offensively we can hang with the best of them. If we're just a little bit better defensively, we're a better team. Hell, I believe that. That's what I thought was the point of this season. I thought the Kings were going to be at least the same offensively as they were last season with a little bit improved defense and they're for sure a play-in team with good a good chance of making the playoffs. I admit, that's where I was. Offense is supposed to be the strength of this team that we're not supposed to worry about. And yet, offensively, the Kings' offensive sets are everybody stand around the perimeter with your hands in your pockets and watch De'Aaron Fox try and run a broken two-man game with Alex Len, Damian Jones, or whatever big man is in the game for the Kings. It results in just isolation and ultimately a, a, a mid-range jumper for Fox, which he was hitting, or a bad shot for a big. Nobody else moves. And then when the Denver Nuggets choose to double-team either the big or the ball handler, nobody moves. Like if you're being, if a guy's being double teamed, somebody's open. That's just basic freaking math. If a guy is being double teamed, that means someone somewhere has an opportunity to score. And yet 
I can't tell you how many times I watched the Nuggets double team either De'Aaron Fox or whatever point guard was on the floor or the big in the two-man game. And the other three Kings were standing on the perimeter, not moving. That's inexcusable, unacceptable. That cannot happen. That is not a fundamental basketball issue. Well, it partially is. That is a effort issue. You couldn't be bothered to run or move or cut when literally nobody was on you. And it was a bunch of different players. It wasn't just one guy who was open all the time. It was a bunch of players on the perimeter, including guys like Harrison Barnes, who know better. Tyrese Halliburton, who knows better. Standing, watching, inexcusable. Boils my blood, man. The two strengths of the Kings, offense, terrible. Transition and speed beaten down the floor by a nearly 300 pound man. And then defensively, we know this team is another utter dumpster fire. Well, at least De'Aaron Fox was good. De'Aaron Fox scored 30 points. He did what he could. Although Kings fans, I know, want to point out the fact that Fox's best games recently, for the most part, have, have come in losses. And you know what? I understand that to some extent. But The De'Aaron Fox who wasn't scoring and didn't look comfortable from the beginning of the season, that Fox looks gone. Should we just disregard and throw that time out or should we still be concerned about that? We'll talk about that in just a second. Right now, though, I want to let you know today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Shopify. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big businesses so that upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. Shopify helps any business at any level scale and makes it as easy as it possibly is. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. You can reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. You gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. It's more than a store. Shopify grows with you. This is a possibility powered by Shopify and Shopify alone. Go to shopify.com slash locked on NBA, all lowercase for a free 14 day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. That's shopify.com slash locked on NBA. Last season, De'Aaron Fox had phenomenal moments. He had multiple Western Conference Player of the Year awards. He helped lead the Kings on two really, really good stretches. Of course, the Kings also went on some horrifically bad stretches too, where Fox was good sometimes, bad other times. But what does De'Aaron Fox from last season and De'Aaron Fox from this season most have in common is the fact that in both seasons, Fox got off to some decently slow starts. This season, it was more prominent. This season, it was more concerning. This season, it was more noticeable. One, because despite Fox getting off that slow start, the Kings were off to a decent start, starting five and four in their first nine games. Two, there were higher expectations with Fox and Halliburton playing together. And three, this was the year that Fox was supposed to make that even bigger jump to an all-star level, leading what was supposed to be a playoff contending team. That De'Aaron Fox that was struggling to score didn't look comfortable. That De'Aaron Fox is gone at this point in time. And the De'Aaron Fox that we expected, the one who looks comfortable on offense, is aggressively attacking, is lights out from mid-range, is hitting at a little bit better clip from three-point range, but is not relying on that, is attacking the basket, is getting to the free-throw line, and for the most part, connecting at the free-throw line. That De'Aaron Fox has shown up and is consistently appearing for the Kings on a nightly basis. So, do we take the De'Aaron Fox from the beginning of this season, as concerning as it was, and do we disregard it? Do we throw it out? Chalk it up to, hey, just like last season, Fox got off to a slow start. Or, do we get concerned about the, albeit it's only two seasons, but the pattern forming of Fox getting off to slow starts and that having a negative effect on this Kings team. Where are you at with that? 
I want to hear from you. At Matt George Sack on Twitter. Email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com or leave your thoughts down in the YouTube comment section down below. I am personally more willing to not completely disregard Fox's slow start to the season because it still happened. You can't just throw away stuff that doesn't work for your argument or, or that you don't like. But you can recognize that it's not indicative of who De'Aaron Fox is. This version of De'Aaron Fox right now, to me, is who Fox is. This version of De'Aaron Fox is why the Kings believe they can build a playoff roster around him. And for the most part, Fox and Halliburton have been playing a lot better together. Now, there have been a handful of games where one of them plays well and the other struggles. There are a lot of those games earlier on in the season. Now, those, those games are fewer and far between. They've, it's been that way really for the last couple of months. Of course, Ty Tyrese Halliburton played really, really, really well. He had to when Fox went into health and safety protocols. But I'm more willing to look at this version of De'Aaron Fox and put my apples in that basket, put my weight in that more than I am the slow starts of the last two seasons. I see people bring up the fact that Fox, while he's having success right now, the Kings are losing games. And the fact that the Kings were five and four and were winning games at the beginning of the season, got off to their best start, played their best stretch of, of basketball that they have all season long while Fox was struggling and say, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's, that's worth paying attention to. I think you're right that it is worth paying attention to, but the reason why I'm not as concerned about that as maybe you are and, and others are is because what I attribute the success of that Kings team at the start of the season to the team playing with a defensive effort that we really haven't seen since. Like if you remember those first nine games, even some of the games that they lost, like the, the jazz game at home, the home opener or uh, the, the warriors game at home, like they're during that stretch, the Kings were playing very spirited, uh, uh, giving a very spirited effort on defense. Offensively, they were playing fine. They weren't great. There were concerns offensively. And I remember discussing here on Locked on Kings, like, wow, this Kings team has improved defensively and regressed offensively, but they're for the most part winning games or they're hovering around 500. So the Kings weren't winning games earlier because Fox wasn't scoring. And they're sure as hell not losing games now because Fox is scoring. Like that's, I think that's a very lazy, slippery slope argument to make. Those are dots that you shouldn't connect, but are easy to connect, if that makes sense. I don't think that it's fair to put that all on De'Aaron Fox. It's definitely fair to be critical of Fox as the leader of what's an ultimately bad basketball team. But I look at Fox of these last couple of games. I look at Fox tonight. I look at Fox against Atlanta and I say, the man was doing what he could. He tried to win that game for his team. He and Tyrese Halliburton were the only players worth paying attention to and who were scoring against Atlanta. Fox almost won that game for the Kings in the fourth quarter, but the Kings defensively as a team couldn't get a stop in this game. Fox is the only reason the Kings didn't lose by 40. Like I'm not willing to disregard Fox's improvement and punish Fox for that because the team is still struggling in areas where we knew this team was going to be bad. And to be honest, they're struggling in areas where they're supposed to be better. I get the comparison of Fox and Halliburton and saying, see, when Halliburton is at his best, not only is he scoring, but he makes his teammates around him better. That's a good argument for Halliburton over Fox because Halliburton is more of a playmaking guard than Fox is. Fox is at his best when he is scoring and scoring a bunch of points. But I don't know necessarily what Fox could have done in these last three games that the Kings have lost to make his teammates significantly better when they're missing shots and they're struggling and they're failing and he's the only one that really can score for the Kings. Like, where did you, who did you want him to pass the ball to in this game? How did you want him to make his teammates better? I just talked about the, the, the rest of his teammates standing around the perimeter watching when he was trying to run a two-man game with Alex Len. 
sitting there watching? How is that on Fox? How does Fox make his teammates better unless he dribbles past everybody, draws all five in, and kicks out to one of those guys who are standing around having a picnic on the perimeter waiting for the waiting for the ball to shoot? Like They have to pull their weight as well. They have to move as well. But again, I want to hear from you. Where are you uh, at with De'Aaron Fox? Are you still concerned about the start to the season? Are you concerned about the team playing bad even when he's playing good right now, losing when he's playing good? Or are you gaining more confidence in De'Aaron Fox even if you're losing confidence in this team? Which again, I'm telling you, this team as a whole is a problem. This group of players, I've said it a million times, this group does not work together. And Monty McNair needs to make a change. Fans are clamoring. I am clamoring for Monty McNair to make a change. And fans are asking, what in the world is Monty McNair doing? Because we've heard nothing. We've seen nothing from McNair. But like I said earlier, maybe the Kings should be thankful that fans still care that much. I'll explain before we wrap up. And I hope you made money on tonight's game. I hope you make money suffering through Kings basketball by using your Kings knowledge, maybe even your pessimism, expect, expecting the Kings to lose. Maybe you're taking the uh, uh, the over on point totals for Kings allowed, maybe, uh, or for points allowed from the Kings. Maybe you're taking whoever is against the Kings and their point spread. If you're you're betting and if you're making money, I hope you're doing it on Bet Online. Bet Online would like to wish you a very happy new year and a happy new betting year as we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond. Bet Online remains the number one spot for all of your best uh, sports wagering action for all of 2022. It's a new year and a new updated desktop and mobile website. If you sign up today, you can receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use promo code Locked On, all one word to get started. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet online, where the game starts. On one hand, I look at Monty McNair and what he's done with the Sacramento Kings. I see his trade that was basically agreed to, the sign and trade to send Bogdan Bogdanovich to Milwaukee in which the, uh, the, the Kings would have gotten Dante DiVincenzo. And then I look at the trade that everybody thought was done sending Buddy Heel to the Los Angeles Lakers for Kyle Kuzma and Montrezl Harrell. Like, I feel for McNair because he's tried to make moves and in two separate occasions, they've completely fallen apart. But at the same time, there are no excuses and nobody's going to feel bad for you in the NBA. You have to make moves. You have to improve this team. And overall, the Kings have not improved. This Kings team is still very much the team that he inherited when he took over for Vladi Divac. At some point, McNair needs to make this team his own. And the way to make his team or this team his own is to make some significant trades. And you've heard me talk a lot about how I think it's time for the Kings to really swing for the fences. I think it's time for the Kings to go for it, either go all in or tank. And I know for a fact that the Kings are not going to tank, especially if they still have a chance to make the playoffs, even if you may think that that's the right move. This Kings team is going to try and go for it, but nobody's going to feel bad for them if they can't get a deal done. I understand that it takes two to tango. I understand that you need two teams. You can't force another team to make a deal or get a deal done. But good general managers are able to get deals done when they need to. And Monty McNair right now, it's all crickets. It's all crickets. We haven't heard a thing from him. We haven't seen a thing from him. And fans are getting extremely impatient. I'm getting extremely impatient. But in reality, the Sacramento Kings should be thankful that team or that the fans are still engaged enough to be impatient. Because I'm telling you, a month more of this and the trade deadline could come and go and fans aren't going to give a damn, period. It is so hard to follow this team and to watch this team and to care about this team, especially even if Monty wasn't around for him, especially after 15 seasons of this crap. Can't blame anybody for wanting to check out and be done. To salvage this season, McNair needs to make a big move, not just to put the Kings in a position to actually have a legitimate chance to make the playoffs, but to give people a reason to tune in and buy tickets and come to games again. Because nobody wants to invest their time and money and watch this group be the same damn thing that they've been for three years. Be the same damn inconsistent disappointment that they are 
with the small chance of success and fun every once in a while. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody cares. So at least right now you have fans, albeit frustratingly, caring enough to be impatient with you. Pretty soon that impatience is going to turn to disinterest. That's when you really should be concerned if you're Monty McNair or Vivek Ranadive or anyone in the Kings organization. Because the one thing that has stuck true for this Kings organization over all these years of suck has been the fans. And you're losing them quick. You're losing them quicker than you're losing games. So McNair's got to do something. He's got to do something quick. I get this team can wait for the actual trade deadline itself at the beginning of February. And they can get away with that with how bad the Western Conference is. But they do that at the risk of this fan base completely checking out. And I think if they're not concerned about that, they damn well should be. Because nobody cares about Kings basketball outside of Sacramento. Sacramento has always cared more than the organization has any right for them to care. And you lose that interest, you got nothing. You literally have nothing. All right, time for you to chime in. Do you care? Are you done? I've had a lot of people text me, tweet me, email me saying, Matt, I can't do it anymore. Is that where you're at? At Matt George Sack on Twitter. Email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Leave your thoughts down on the YouTube comment section down below. I'd love to hear from you. I, again, hope you will stick with Locked On Kings regardless of how little you care about this Kings team. We'll get you through it or we'll try and get through it together. Of course, if anything happens with rumors in, in, in regards to trades for the Kings, of course, with upcoming games and everything, Locked On Kings will continue even if I want to pull my hair out and my eyes are bleeding uh, watching the Kings play like they are uh, like you are trust me i i I sometimes am jealous of people's luxury of just being able to turn off the tv and go do something else there have been many times that i want to but i'm not complaining about what i do i love what i do and more the majority of of the love that i have for what i do is the opportunity to get to interact uh, and host a show and, and talk with so many kings fans not just in sacramento but around the world i appreciate you so so much thank you so much for listening again can't wait to have you join me for the next episode until then my name is matt george you have been listening to locked on kings part of the locked on podcast network